trying to transmit classical information over uh, quantum channels. So today what I want to talk about is how to, um, well, a couple of different topics related to uh, quantum correlations. So um, specifically, I want to discuss dis distillable entanglement. Um, quantum capacities. Uh, and impossible operations. Um, all in the context of, of Gaussian um, states and channels. Okay, so uh, first I want to talk about uh, distillable entanglement. Um, and this is, relates to uh, this class of operations that uh, I guess uh, Fernando mentioned, and, and I think I mentioned a little bit uh, yesterday, called LOCC, local operations. Uh, and classical communication. So the setting that, that we're really thinking about um, in this case is if you have some, uh, some entangled state that's shared between two distant parties, A and B, uh, and they can do local operations. So Alice can do some sort of uh, operation here. Maybe it's a measurement. There's some residual state that comes out. She gets some classical information. She can report the outcome of her, state, her measurement to Bob, who conditioned on that outcome. Let's say the outcome was I. Does some, uh, some uh, call it OB, OA sub i, some operation that depends on the out outcome that Alice got. Uh, and he'll possibly get some classical information out. He'll have some residual state and also some information that he transmits back and forth. And these operations where you can do anything you like uh, uh, locally, but you can only communicate back and forth using classical information, they're called uh, LOCC. And they're sort of an, a natural uh, class of things that you can do um, if you have some uh, quantum state that's, that's distributed over some long distance. And then the sort of one of the most, uh, one of the most fu fundamental questions you can ask is let's say I have some state rho AB. And as you typically do in these situations, maybe I have n copies of the state. I want to find some way to turn this noisy state into some perfect pure state entanglement. So uh, I'd like to figure out some way to do an LOCC protocol. I'll call it P. Uh, that at the output comes out with some maximally entangled states. And this can be sort of just high fidelity maximally entangled states instead of uh, perfect maximally entangled states. And this, this phi plus is just uh, a fixed bell state. OK, so if for some uh, number r, I can make given n copies of the state, n times r copies of an EPR pair that's, that's very close to a pure, and gets closer and closer to perfect as the number n grows, then I say that r is an achievable rate for distillation of, of uh, entanglement from this, from this mixed state. And can Yeah, it can be a pure state with less entanglement. Um, and yeah, and th then actually this protocol isn't going to be as complicated as, as this kind of thing. It'll be much easier. Um, but it needn't be mixed. It's just that the really difficult case to solve is when it's mixed. But it, um, OK, so if there's such a protocol, we say this rate is achievable. And we call the uh, 
the best achievable rate for distillation of these EPR pairs from the state, uh, the distillable entanglement. Okay, so for example, um, for, for a very simple example, let's say we have the state phi plus. We might wonder what the distillable entanglement of that state is. It's trivial to distill phi plus to phi plus, so the distillable entanglement of that is just one. If, on the other hand, you have some pure state, I'll call it psi. If it has uh, Schmidt uh, coefficients lambda i, I can always write a pure state like this. And in that case, it's slightly more complicated to distill. You just have to basically do a measurement on each side and project down onto the typical space of the uh, mixed state on either A or B. And the distillable entanglement of something like that is actually just equal to the entropy of one side. OK, so there's a, a third kind of straightforward example to understand that I want to mention, which is uh, separable states. So if I have a state rho AB that's a probabilistic mixture of product states, then no matter what LOCC protocol you apply to this state, um, you can't distill any EPR pairs out of it, OK? Um, and actually, you can make any such state by just doing LOCC protocols and starting from product state. OK, so the distillable entanglement of this state is, is going to be 0. Would you get what? Uh huh. Well, will you get the separability criterion for Werner states from the distillability criterion? Um. On qubits, yes. Um, no, you can choose whichever maximally entangled state you like because they're all unitarily equivalent. So if I said you should target making phi minus, then you could first make phi pluses and apply a z to the local uh, basis or something like that. So you just have to pick which one you're interested in getting. And I usually pick phi, phi plus because you don't have to write any minus signs, right? It's just easy. OK, so. It's not, in general, easy to figure out what this distillable entanglement is, OK? And, and actually, it's even, it's even harder. Well, it's not harder, but it's also still hard to just ask, if I give you a state, rho AB, is it 0? That's also a difficult question. Um, so w one of the things I'm going to tell you about today is a test that you can, you can do that will tell you, well, if, you, if your state uh, fails this test, then, uh, sorry, if your state passes this test, then you know that it must have zero distillable entanglement. Okay? So it's, it's sort of a partial answer to this question of distillable entanglement. There, um, and it, it's kind of based on um, a very well, an, a simple observation about this, this state. So let's say I have a separable state. And let me define um, the transpose on the B system as just taking 
ij and mapping it to ji. OK? So if I take a, uh, take a matrix A. Same, I think the pressure on the top is going down. It's OK. Unfortunately, these are not as good as touch screens. <laughs> OK, sorry. Um, <laughs> OK. OK, so the trace of uh, the transpose of a matrix A is just, uh, this is just another way of saying you take the, the usual transpose. And this is a very interesting operation, because if I take a quantum state, rho A, and take its transpose, let's say, um, well, let's put it this way. The transpose of A is just equal to the complex conjugate of A, because A is going to be Hermitian. And since the eigenvalues of, of rho, rather, are, uh, are real, when I take a complex conjugate, I can change the eigenbasis of the state, but I don't change the eigenvalues. So if it started off a physical state, it, it ends up a physical state. OK? So in other words, it maps positive density matrices to positive density matrices. And we call, this the, uh, we call this T positive. So one of the consequences of that is that if I take T and apply it to only half of one of these separable states up here, it's linear operator, right? So I can just sort of pull it through the sum and apply it to these individual terms, I get a physical state back. <coughs> and since it's a physical state, actually, well, I know it's positive semi-definite. That's what physical states are. Um, So it, sur it turns out that while this is true for separable states, it's not true for every state. So um, let me, make, let me uh, make an example. Basically, let's, let's, take a pure, uh, let's, let's take an entangled state, a maximally entangled state. When I write out this, this guy as a, a projector, it looks like this. Sorry. OK. And the way this, this is called a, a partial transpose, the way it works, um, the way a partial transpose works is that you just kind of pick the sub-blocks associated with the system that you're going to be acting on, and you do a transpose to them, but you leave the big blocks alone. So if you wanted to do a complete transpose, you could transpose each of these things and then shuffle around the locations of the blocks. Partial transpose, you just do a transpose of the blocks. And then something interesting happens. Because if you look at, oh, whoops, whoops, I uh, wanted to apply a transpose to this. OK, so we apply a transpose, a partial transpose to this uh, projector onto a maximally entangled state. And we get something uh, which, on this block out here, is just the identity. But in here, if you look at this block, that's just x, right? And x has um, both positive and negative eigenvalues. So we find if we take this pure state, maximally entangled, and we do a partial transpose, uh, it, we get something that's not positive anymore. And what that's telling us is that even though this transpose, when we applied it to half of, uh, 
applied it to just um, a single state like this, uh, it maintained physicality of the state. It's not actually a physical operation, because if I try to apply it to just a part of a larger quantum state, it ends up mapping me outside the, uh, outside the set of uh, density matrices. So this transposes the classic example of something that's it's positive, meaning um, it maps states to states in this sense, but it's not completely positive. <laughs> meaning there are states when you, there are states such that when you apply identity tensor the transpose to those states, you, you uh, no longer get a positive state out. And it turns out, I mean, as we saw here, that the state that shows you that the thing is not completely positive has to be an entangled state. Um, and uh, the reason is that if we start with a separable state, we end up with a separable but physical state. OK, so um, there's now something interesting about this partial transpose operation, which is that if I start with some state, well, let's imagine I have some state rho AB. And I, I don't know anything about it, really, except for the fact that when I apply this partial transpose to the state, I know it's positive semi-definite. Well, it could be separable, but maybe not. It might be an entangled state, um, but just happens to satisfy this property. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I'll just grab some water. Um, so it kind of looks like, you know, it's, if I have a state like this, it's similar in some ways to a separable state and dissimilar to one of these pure entangled states. So you might wonder, OK, can I distill any, any pure entanglement out of this state? And it turns out the, the answer is no, you can't. Uh, we can show that this um, positive partial transpose implies that the distillable entanglement of the state is zero. And over on this board, I will do that. Oh, one thing I should just mention. Let's say we have a state um, that has positive partial transpose. Um, this partial transpose operation preserves the trace of the state, uh, meaning that since this row AB has trace 1, so does the partial transpose of row AB. And since the partial transpose also is positive semi-definite, it's also positive semi-definite trace 1. So this thing is going to be some potentially different uh, physical state. We'll use that a little bit later. OK, so first let's imagine some, let's <coughs> some LOCC protocol that we, try to, we use to try to distill entanglement from, uh, from this rho AB. Well, any LOCC protocol is going to be begin with one party, let's say Alice, does some partial measurement, gets some classical information out, transmits it to Bob. Bob, conditioned on that partial, uh, that partial measurement, does his own partial measurement, gets some information out, transmits it to Alice. And they go back and forth, and they stop whenever they feel like it. Um, in this case, if you're distilling entanglement, they're going to stop when you get very good EPR pairs out. OK, so let's just uh, talk about what it looks like when Alice does her first measurement. The initial state, rho AB, gets mapped to
just um, this is the post-measurement state, and Alice and Bob now hold on to the uh, information about the measurement outcome i. So I guess I can append some i also. And now conditioned on this, now at the next stage, conditioned on this, this i, Bob is going to do some operation. So we can call it, we'll call that operation, uh, I don't know, mb. It depends on i. And it's a measurement that has some outcome j. And when they both, when they get an outcome ij, the conditional state is going to be rho AB sandwiched between this guy and then Bob's going to tell Alice what the measurement outcome is uh, and they go back and forth like this until some, at some point um, they decide to stop Now, if we look at each of the individual terms of this sum, they all take the following form. They all look like they all look like this. But now, and, and that's just the conditional state given the various measurement outcomes they've got. Sure. If they do some LOCC protocol, it involves first a measurement on Alice that she transmits the answer of to Bob. Um, then conditioned on that outcome, Bob does some measurement on his part and transmits the answer back to Alice. And they keep going back and forth and back and forth. And they end up with a sum of a bunch of terms. Each term represents a particular series of measurement outcomes that they could have gotten. And conditioned on those measurement outcomes, the state that sits here is always of this form. Right? So for example, in this case, if the measurement outcome is ij, um, a here is going to be m sub i, and uh, b here is going to be m sub j super i. Is that clear? OK. So now, the point is, I wanna, uh, we want to know what the partial transpose of this thing is. This is, the conditional, this is the conditional state. And it turns out that actually this partial transpose almost commutes through this A tensor B. In fact, this is equal to A tensor B transpose of, rho of identity tensor transpose rho AB A tensor B transpose dagger, which is just B star, but I'll write it like that. Um, because what we know about this thing is that this is, this is a physical state. It's positive semi-definite. And when I sandwich something that's positive semi-definite in between um, a, uh, a matrix and its Hermitian conjugate, the thing stays positive semi-definite. Dagger on the second A. Oh, yeah, yeah, dagger on the A. Good, sorry. Um, so now what we found is when we do this distillation procedure, we always make a conditional state that looks like this. And any state that looks like this, if we started with something that is positive partial transpose, this also looks, has positive partial transpose. Right? So by doing these LOCC things, we can't get out of the class of positive partial transpose states. Um, so can anyone tell me what the implications of this are?
Right. Our target state over here has negative partial transpose, and actually by quite a bit. It has a, an eigenvalue of like minus a half. Um, so if you're going to start with a PPT state, you can't get anywhere near such a state because you're always going to end up with a PPT state. So um, this is kind of a nice test. It means that if you have a state that has positive partial transpose, in some sense it's very noisy because by um, local operations in classical communication, you can't do anything to, to uh, purify that state, to get any really good pure state entanglement out of it. Now, actually, it turns out there are very interesting states that have positive partial transpose but, but are not entangled. Uh, uh, that are entangled, rather. They're entangled, but they have positive partial transpose. They're called bound entangled states. And those are cool because in order to make them, you need to start with some pure state entanglement. Um, but once you make them, you can't get that pure state entanglement back. This here to here? Uh, let's see. I mean, I can write it out. Um, so let's write it like this. If I have some density matrix, rho AB, it's going to be a sum over I1, I2, J1, J2 of rho I1. I2, J1, J2, on AB. So these are just some complex numbers that are the elements of your density matrix. OK, and let's see how we're going to do this. What I want to show is if I take Identity tensor B, identity tensor B dagger if I, uh, of this original state. Well, I want to show that if I first do a partial transpose on this and then conjugate by B and B dagger, it's the same as if instead I conjugate by B and B dagger and then do a partial transpose and add a uh, complex conjugate. Um, it's kind of a... Well, doing it right now, I think it would take up a lot of arithmetic and indices. But I think that maybe the, the tutorial, we can talk about it. How's that? One short question. Yes? When you do the partial transpose, on the transposition sequence of operators gets reversed. Yeah. Is that built into that formula for the B part of it? Shouldn't the transpose on B part reverse the sequence of a product in the B part? Can you understand your question much faster? <laughs> so I'm mean, the thing is, you, you take the partial transpose map and put the inverse on this side. So uh, you, it like yeah, yeah, it's an invertible map. So that's uh, what is the figure map. I'm sorry, I don't think I <laughs> I uh, quite understood. If you take a product of two operators transpose, the order gets in the, in the change. Yeah. But that's not happening here. Oh, well. That was his question. So I answered by saying that you push this, when you're pushing this map through, you uh, take this map, this inverse, and so on. <coughs> oh, but actually, I think that might be the answer to the question, right? Because, look, as I push it through, the B transpose comes over because when I did the p partial transpose, they went around. So the sequence has reversed. Yeah. No. I think so. No. <laughs> I mean, you see, A, A, A tensor B was there, and that goes to A tensor B transpose. But you would see if you had a C tensor D on the other side. Yeah, if there was C tensor D here. I, I think Andreas is right. If I had C tensor D here, this would now become D transpose. And, and the. C transpose would come Yeah, and C would come over here. Or, sorry, C would be here. And, and wait, let's see. A, B, C, D. 
D would come back and B would come over here. Yeah. I think that's right. And I think it, it, it explains why, uh, explains what you were asking. Um, does, does that make sense? Or but, do, uh, what I said is different. So, okay. Uh, so one of them has to be correct. Oh, good. So we've got it. <laughs> okay, so um, now I want to talk, and so this is about Gaussian stuff, so let's talk about when is a PPT, when is a, a Gaussian state PPT. Um, so we agreed ah, that we're interested in states where identity tensor transpose is uh, rho of rho AB is positive semi-definite. And that means that this is actually a physical state. Right? So if we have a Gaussian state, uh, we, we, we know the, the criterion for when it's going to be, uh, when it's going to be physical. Right? It's going to have some gamma ij. <coughs> and given by the symmetrized expectation of these r's, Uh, and this gamma ij has to satisfy gamma plus <laughs> ij bigger than or equal to 0. And this thing is now the, uh, this thing with uh, the zeros and the minus 1s on the off diagonal. So let's try to turn this criterion into something about this gamma. Uh, I think there's room here. OK, so first of all, for this row AB, there's going to be some gamma AB. And it's going to have some block structure like this. So <coughs> what we really want to ensure is we know that gamma AB is going to satisfy this. But what we'd like to ensure, in addition, is that this thing is, is a physical state. So that is going to make us compute something else. I'll call it gamma tilde ij. And it'll just be equal to the expectation of these rij's, not not applied to rho AB, which is the state we're interested in, but applied to the thing that we want to show as a physical state. Identity tensor transpose um, rho AB. And now the nice thing is, if I have some state in here, and I do a partial, tr or some object in here, and I do a partial transpose on the B system, that doesn't change the trace. OK? Uh, and what that means is the, uh, um, the adjoint of doing trace on B here is applying a, tr a trace on B over here. So this thing is just going to be equal to trace of Now I do trace on this instead, identity tensor trace, or transpose of rho AB. And now we have to figure out what's going on with um, this part. So what are these RIJs? Do you guys remember? Yeah, yeah, the, the P's and Q's, the quadratures. Um, <coughs> so uh, Q is like this, right? And P was like this. I can't remember if this is right or maybe it's without the minus sign. 
Is it okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, and these A's, we also remember what they do. And the, the, the important thing is that uh, with these A's, the, uh, uh, the entries are real. So that A dagger is A transpose. Um, so what this partial transpose on these R's is doing is just putting minus signs in front of some of the, some of the quadratures. Which ones? Well, if there's a B quadrature involved, it gets applied, the transpose. If it's an A quadrature, nothing happens to it. Now, what happens with Q? What's the transpose of Q? Q, right. How about P? What's the transpose of P? That's minus P. OK, so this thing is looking pretty good, right? It's looking like exactly this gamma ij, except there's some minus signs running around. So gamma ab, sorry, gamma a up here just gets left alone by this partial transpose. This, if uh, I have a quadrature in that's a p, so uh, these, these are the a's, these are the b's, these are the a's, these are the b's quadratures. What I do in order to figure out what this gamma ij tilde is, is I go along my rows, and if I get to a place where I have a p quadrature, I add a minus sign. OK? So the first row, I'll leave alone. The second row, I add a minus sign. The third row, I leave alone. Fourth, get a minus sign. I do that with the columns, and then I also do it with the rows. Uh, so what this gamma ij tilde ends up being in this case is just equal to identity tensor j on b gamma identity tensor j. OK? And this is now supposed to be a correlation matrix of a physical state, because this thing was supposed to be a physical state. So what we learn then is in order to check that a state is, uh, is, uh, has positive partial transpose, we have to compute this gamma tilde. And make sure it's non-negative. And we can do uh, another step using this observation. If we just conjugate this whole equation now again by identity tensor j, we can move this tilde sort of over onto j. Well, now j tilde well, it's identity tensor jb um, jab identity tensor I think I need a transpose Tensor J transpose. So this should, I think, have a transpose here. Uh, and what that ends up being is just the direct sum of two J's, a JA here, zeros on the off diagonals, and a minus JB down here. So this gives us a clean way to figure out whether a state, a Gaussian state, is a positive partial transpose. Um, so now instead of checking this condition, just as easily we can check that condition. And if they're both satisfied, I have a physical state that has positive partial transpose, and therefore no distillable entanglement. So now that we covered this, I want to tell you just some fun facts about, <coughs> about positive uh, partial transpose Gaussian states. Um, and In the original, the AB was block diagonal. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, J, 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 J B, J, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, well, I agree that J tilde A B is what you have written last. Uh -huh. But uh, uh, the previous uh, step, what it is doing, I'm, I think it's, I'm not understanding. Because identity. <coughs> Tense. Uh, is it identity plus J B? Oh, sorry, it's a plus. All of. 
I'm so sorry. All of these are direct sums. Yeah. Now, uh, that's not really doing much because we're well, not putting the tra JB transpose. Yeah, it shouldn't right. be transpose. Right. So that means only you are using that JB, JB square is minus. JB. Yeah, that, all it does is throw in the minus sign down here. Okay. You think it's overkill? Huh? It's overkill. It's it's yes, yeah. okay. I mean, it was the the way that I saw to turn. Sort of, I wanted to move the minus signs from here to there, uh -huh. right? And one way I could see to justify that, while still getting well, one way I could see to justify that, but make sure I po I preserve this positivity was conjugate by something that would do it for me, right? If you conjugate by something, you, you're going to maintain the positivity. Then that will be not JB, that will be sigma 3. I mean, sigma 3 will do this thing. I mean, sigma 3 when commutes through. Oh, yeah, okay. J, J is sigma 2. So when sigma 3 commutes through, it will change the signature. Okay, okay, so you're right. Because you are using J everywhere. I mean, J has no. Uh, you, have no you don't have any non commuting objects, so therefore, the, unless you. Change signature by hand, it will not <coughs> That's what you are doing with Okay, okay, I think you're right. I think I, so it should be simpler than this either. Well, it's a, the mirror reflection is different from the uh, symmetric metric. Mm -hmm. it's okay. Okay. Um, Having, having discussed this condition for positive partial transpose for Gaussian state, now I just want to tell you some facts about these positive partial transpose states. Um, I'm going to state them, I guess, without proof. So, so. Uh, Facts. Okay, so if I have one mode by one mode on A and B, then uh, positive partial transpose, that implies uh, separability. So there aren't, there aren't uh, PPT, there aren't bound entangled states on two modes. Actually, on 1 by n modes, PPT implies separability. And even better in this case, not PPT implies distillability. That means on a two-mode Gaussian state, the if it's, not P, if it's not separable, if it's entangled at all, it can be distilled down to pure state entanglement. That's very cool. There are 2 by 2 uh, PPT states that are entangled. You can construct them. And, and uh, depending on time, I may show you one at the end. But something even better uh, happens. So I didn't mention over here, for just regular discrete states, if you have some row AB, and we know that it has positive partial transpose, that implies that the distillable entanglement of the state is 0. You might wonder about the converse, right? Let's say you have 0 distillable entanglement. Does that imply uh, that the thing is PPT? Well, nobody knows of examples that you cannot distill um, but have non-positive partial transpose. So nobody knows of a counterexample to this, although people have the feeling for some particular states that probably you cannot distill from them, but they know for sure they're not PPT. Okay, so this is, this is a, a very... Um, interesting question that people call. Oh, sure. Um, 
we don't know of any states with zero distillable entanglement that don't have positive partial transpose. We have examples of states that have non-positive partial transpose that we think you cannot distill entanglement from. But we have no method of proof. There's just some, well, let's say evidence. You know, people try whatever distillation protocols they can think of. They um, try to prove that they, they'll give some good, uh, good results. And in general, they never uh, find some method of distilling from these states. So the question is, is, is there an NPT state um, if it's NPT, it's definitely entangled, right? All separable states were PPT. This is some other kind of state that's not PPT, but has zero distillable entanglement. So this is, this is a big question. It's hard, I mean, it's hard to resolve, or people haven't resolved it. And uh, well, I, I think a lot of people have, have spent effort on it. It's very interesting. So the cool thing over here is again, if I have a Gaussian state that's not positive partial transpose, then it's distillable. So bound entanglement for Gaussian states is just exactly the same thing as positive partial transpose. It's an if and only if statement, which, which is, I think, really cool. Uh, and that's an example of the kinds of things you can, well, that's an example of how things can get a little bit simpler when you're trying to think about uh, Gaussian states rather than general states, or even rather than, um, even rather than finite dimensional states. Mm -hmm. No. They will, uh, they will have positive partial transpose. Ah, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about different things. This is the number of modes. These are infinite dimensional. Infinite dimensional Gaussian states with two modes on each side. This can be PPT but bound entangled. It's, you should, right? It's not the same as having a two-dimensional system on each side. I have two modes, each of which has infinite dimensions. Does that, is that clear? Well, <laughs> yeah, basically. It's just kind of magic that when you're dealing with Gaussian states, right, you can still write down these finite matrices and actually learn things about them. But yeah, behind it, it's all infinite dimensional. Nothing about two qubits is going to tell you is going to correspond here. OK, so we talked a little bit about distillable entanglement and the question of whether a state has non-zero distillable entanglement. And for Gaussian states, this is just a solved question. Whereas it's still quite an interesting open question for, for finite dimensions. And now this is connected to a question of uh, capacities. So I want to move now to uh, the question of quantum capacity. So I'll just remind you of the definition of a quantum capacity now. So we have some noisy quantum channel, N. And we have many uses of it. And our goal is to transmit quantum states from the sender to the receiver. And here's how we do it. We take some input state. 
that lives in a finite dimensional Hilbert space. Um, let's say it's n times r qubits. We do some encoding operation that encodes it into the inputs of our noisy channel. At the output, we do some decoding operation that gives us some state again in the same Hilbert space as the input. And we say this is a, this is a good code if uh, the concatenation of the encoder, the channels, and the decoder is very close to the identity, meaning when I put a, a psi in here, I get a state out that's very close to psi. And close, I mean trace norm. And a rate is achievable if in the limit of large n, uh, such schemes exist with, with, uh, with the high fidelity in the limit. Uh, and the quantum capacity is just uh, is the, the best rate you can get here, best rate in qubits per channel use. Okay, so let's. Psi e is close to psi prime should happen for all elements of the input Hilbert space. Yes, that's right. Yeah, sorry. So if I have a good code like this, and I take half of an EPR pair, or a generalized EPR pair, so this guy. Again, is it uh, possible that in finite dimension, I mean, this uh, R being, uh, I mean, 2 power R being, R, R is finite, so that 2 power in R is finite. In finite dimension, mm -hmm. at uh, these things being close in one norm and not being close in another norm, could it ever, I mean, it's being, I mean, the, the whole thing is a, yeah, I guess you can have, uh, well, it's certainly much asking a lot more to, to insist that, uh, hmm, actually, I'm not sure. Andreas, do you know? <coughs> Done. I mean, but uh, the story is different asymptotically, right? Hmm. It's not bounded. Um, um, um. <coughs> I see. So uh, because you are having it, OK, because of the syntax. <coughs> OK, let me think about if I have a good code of, of rate r, I'm going to make halves of EP, uh, maximally entangled states. Mm -hmm. Put them into the encoder. I'm going to write, this is many uses of the channel. And remember, there are two, uh, I can always think of this channel, instead of being a noisy evolution of rho, it, I can always think of it as, as a, uh, a unitary evolution of rho followed by partial trace. So I'm going to make this be the unitary associate it with it. And these are all of the b to the n outputs of the channel. These are the e to the n environments of the channel. Since there's a, a good decoder, I can decode. And because of satisfying this fidelity criterion, we also actually know that the state we make here is going to be of the form a maximally entangled state. Well, let me label these these A uh, well I can always write this also as some some reversible operation A uh, 
a prime, f, and these are e to the n. And the, uh, the thing that I wanted to mention only was that if these, this is a good code, it means that I can make good maximally entangled states between a and a prime. And it leaves just some other state on, on uh, f and e to the n. And uh, I point this out because it, it has the nice, the, nice, uh, the nice property that it makes it clear that actually, if I have a good code and I put halves of EPR pairs into the code, if I look at the reduced state e to the n, uh, that's a product state. And that's related to the, 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 well, what that means roughly is that if I want to have a good error correcting code for the quantum information that maps uh, this system over to A prime, it's essential that uh, none of the information about the input to the error correcting code gets uh, leaked over to E, the environment. So in some sense, the correlations we want to get with the, with the output of the channel are um, quantified by the amount of extra information that the output uh, gets um, in excess of what the, what the environment gets. So this is just a kind of a way to try to motivate um, a coding theorem that I'm going to state but not prove, which, uh, which gives us a lower bound for the quantum capacity in the same way that this mutual information on the first day gave us a lower bound and actually gave us an expression for the classical capacity. And the whole of O information that we discussed yesterday gave us a lower bound for the classical capacity. Mm -hmm. So you and the definition, so in the classical case, you have log of number of messages you can send reliably divided yep. by number of channel users. Yep. So in the quantum case, that would translate, number of messages would translate to the dimension of a space or something. Yeah, dimension of the Hilbert space. Log of that. Dimension of a subspace. Yeah. Yeah, dimension of this input space here. Take log of that divided by the number of channel uses, and that gives you the achievable rate in now qubits per channel use. OK, so now. Um, the rate that we know you can achieve for a quantum channel of using uh, random coding strategies is given by the following. It's a maximum all over all mixed states at the input of the channel of the entropy of the output of the channel on that state minus the entropy of the environment of the channel on that state. Where now I'm using this n hat to represent the complementary <laughs> channel that we, that we discussed yesterday. OK? So this says, if I pick some input state phi, uh, the amount of information that, or the amount of entropy that that induces on B, the amount, the amount of entropy, the, the excess of entropy that that induces on B over the amount it induces on E is exactly the rate that we can achieve for random coding. Uh, of the, on, this, uh, on this channel. So we know that the quant, well, we don't prove, but you can prove that this gives us a lower bound for the quantum capacity. And in the same way that we saw yesterday, if we regularize it, the quantum capacity is just the regularization of this quantity Q1. And uh, this is called the coherent information. And just like, uh, just like with the Holovo information we discussed yesterday, uh, sometimes this is additive. And then you can get an expression for the quantum capacity. Sometimes it's additive and it's just equal to the coherent information. Other times it's not additive. 
and uh, you can get an excess capacity by considering this quantity optimized on multiple channel uses. So we were talking earlier about distillable entanglement of Gaussian states. And we saw a criterion for determining when the distillable entanglement of such a state is zero. And there's a, a close connection between distillable entanglement of a state and um, the quantum capacity of a channel. So at this point, I'd like to give an example of a class of channels different from the one that we not, not closely related to the one that we just discussed, with it different from the distinct from this notion of positive partial transpose, but that also have zero quantum capacity. And when you're trying to understand the quantum capacity of a quantum channel, uh, as you can see over there with this this uh, expression, the complementary channel is always going to be very important to consider too. You can't just think about what, is the, what are the input-output relations for the channel. You have to think about how information gets leaked to the environment of the channel too. So I, I want to give uh, a simple example of a Gaussian channel and then show you that it has uh, zero quantum capacity. I take a 50-50 beam splitter. My input state goes in here. I put a vacuum in there. And um, this is the environment of the channel. And this is the output of the channel. So let me call this channel just uh, N, mapping A to B. And the isometry, I'll just call it U, and it maps A to B E. Now, uh, actually, before I show you that this has to have zero quantum capacity, I have to show you another, uh, another uh, operation. So we talked about this partial transpose. That's sort of it, that maps physical states to physical states if you only act on, uh, on uh, one system. But if you try to make it act on two systems, then it becomes a non-physical operation. So there's another non-physical operation that I want to I want to mention um, that is going to be relevant for this channel. Um, does anybody have any non-physical operations that they like? What do you mean non-physical? Well, something that a, a mapping on quantum states that um, you can't actually implement in the lab. No, well, trace preserving completely positive. That's exactly the allowed operations, right? <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> oh yeah, fine. Of course, post selection is essential. It's the only way to ever do anything. But um, okay, fine. Well, let, let's not talk about that. <laughs> Some of my best friends are experimentalists. <laughs> so, sorry. Yes? So uh, when you talked about the classical capacity of the quantum channel, mm -hmm. you had the, uh, um, so of course there were uh, two capacities. One was the classical capacity, and the other one was private capacity which took care of what went into the environment. Mm -hmm. Somehow in the quantum motion, that aspect is already inbuilt in the yes. definition of the capacity itself. Yes. Do you have anything to say about this? Um, well, the reason that, that it's inbuilt is because of that, this discussion we had, which is 
there's no way to transmit quantum information except purely, completely privately. So if you leak information about your, if you leak information about your state to the environment, that's going to necessarily decohere your state. So, so that's why, kind of why it's built in. And what you said is also, or that's also related to the fact that we had these three capacities. The quantum capacity is uh, going to be a lower bound for the private capacity. Because if I have a good quantum code, um, then it's going to allow me to transmit an entire subspace in such a way that the environment learns nothing about which state gets transmitted. So then I could just pick a basis for that, and then I can also transmit classical information. It turns out that, that, um, that you can separate these. The, the, you, this can be strictly bigger. Um, but certainly, this gives a lower bound. Oh, here's, here's the operation I'm going to. Uh, that's not physical. It's cloning, right? There's no, there's no way to take a, uh, there's no completely positive trace preserving map, say, to, uh, that takes as its input a single quantum state and spits out two copies of that state. Um, the, key, the, key, the key thing to, about the statement of this is that this has to be an unknown state. Okay? The, uh, the apparatus just has to take in, do some operation on the input and spit out some output. And the reason this is not physical is, is kind of clear. It's just not a linear map. The only things we can do to quantum states are linear maps. And this thing is sort of explicitly quadratic, right? So this is, this is impossible. Yes. Um, yeah, partial time reversal. Actually, um, I, I like this picture. So maybe, yeah, let me just, sorry. There's a fun way to see why time reversal has to be, has to be impossible. And the way you do it is you take um, a two-mode squeezed state. So I take a beam splitter. I say I have P1 here, P2 here, or P1, Q1. And I have P2, Q2 here. And I combine them at a beam splitter. Now what does that mean? That means that in this arm, I've got, uh, I've got 1 over root 2, p1, q1, plus 1 over root 2, p2, q2. And down in this arm, I get 1 over root 2, p1, q1, minus 1 over root 2, p2, q2. Now let's say I could actually implement this time reversal. I just put a T here. Well, remember we discussed all that's going to do is it's going to make the, uh, the Q's stay the same and the P's, they're going to get a, neg a minus sign. So now I'm going to get 1 over root 2 minus P1 Q1 minus 1 over root 2 minus P2 Q2. And then I want to recombine these guys at a beam splitter. I'll just, to save space, I'll put this arrow here, and I'll recombine them like this. So now all we have to do again is to just add, take with these square roots and add the things together. So what's going to happen here? Um, I'm just going to add this and that with an extra square root. So I'm going to have a half. So I'm going to get a P1 and a minus P1 and a P2 and a plus P2. OK? And <coughs> the half is going gonna, is gonna to cancel out. So I'm going to get a P2 in the first mode. And then here, I'm going to get a Q1 and a Q1 and a Q2 and a minus Q2. So I'm going to get a, a Q, Q1, yes? OK, P1, yeah, Q1, Q1, they add, Q2, Q2, they subtract. So we get a Q1. OK, so now the quadratures that describe 
this mode here are P2 and Q1, except I know how to make squeezed states. So I'm going to squeeze down uh, Q1 here. I'm going to make Q really tiny here. And I'm going to make P really long. And here, I'm going to squeeze down P2, and I'm going to get let Q be really big. And now, I have some state that's tiny. Its, it's Wigner function is like that big, and it's a totally non-physical state. So this is sort of the analog of showing you get <coughs> negative partial, you get uh, negative eigenvalues if you try to take partial transpose on, a, on an EPR pair. If you make a two-mode squeeze state like this, you end up with modes that uh, have unphysical subspa uh, substates as far as you can, well, that don't satisfy the uncertainty relations. So I, that was just a tangent, but uh, I like that proof that you can't do, uh, you can't do partial like, transpose. Uh, I would make it not much simpler than this. I mean, in the standard pot basis, the number basis, mm -hmm. transpose is the same as time reversal. Under time reversal, uh, I mean, A and A direct get interchanged in the standard basis. So, or, or in, in the standard basis, uh, time reversal is the same as transpose. And you already argued that transpose is unphysical. Oh, yeah, but I just wanted to show you another way to see uh -huh. it for Gaussian channels and states and stuff. But the thing I also like about this is it seems to be unphysical because you're getting a violation of uncertainty principle. And the other argument just didn't seem to have that property at all. There was no uncertainty principle around. So, <laughs> pardon? Positive <laughs> state is I mean, uncertainty principle is equal unto positivity of states. Really? Yeah. Well, uncertainty principle, as I looked at this, because I, I exhibited only the second order, but they want to write it for higher order, then it's equal and so I maintain that. Oh, okay, so then if it's equivalent, then this is this must be equivalent. So. Well, uncertainty principle, violation of uncertainty principle mm -hmm. is uh, uh, implies violation of positivity. Yeah, yeah. And okay. if state is not, uh, doesn't go to state, it's not physical. Okay. okay. Oh, okay, so now let's try to argue that that uh, that such states don't have any quantum capacity. I'm going to show you an argument that works for us, not quite for this channel, but it's close enough, okay? And it's simpler. The argument goes like this. Uh, let's say I have a channel. And it has the property that when I take this unitary U, A, B, e, U that maps A to B, E, and I apply the swap of B and E. So I just switch the two, uh, the two systems, then it's invariant. Right, so this is going to be equal to this. In that case, the channel has to have no quantum capacity. Um, sure. Um, so we have some channel, right? And it's got some, some isometric extension, meaning a unitary <laughs> together with an appending some uh, fixed state. And if that unitary has the property, you know, that unitary maps A to B and E. And if that unitary has the property that if I permute B and E, it's invariant, we'll call the states the channel symmetric. And we're going to show that any channel that has this kind of unitary extension has zero quantum capacity. And this is sort of morally of the symmetric form. It's not quite because of the extra phase that you pick up when you do the, when you do the, uh, the reflection here, um, but it's close enough that this argument with a little tweaking works too. Okay, so what's the argument? Okay, so le uh, let's suppose the channel didn't have a quantum, it uh, did have a positive quantum capacity. Then there would be some way to take a quantum state. Let's say it's in uh, just a qubit, Hilbert space two. 
and I can do some encoding to it. And what it means that it has a good has a quantum capacity is that if I have enough copies of it and I get all the outputs together like this, there's a decoding operation that gets the channel through, that gets the state through. Fine. So suppose such a thing exists. Well, if this channel is symmetric, I could have just as easily taken all the outputs to the environment and put them down over here and done the same decoding to them and get the state out again. So any channel like this, if it is going to have a quantum capacity, um, it would also allow me to perform this operation of mapping, uh, mapping psi to psi tensor psi. Okay. So it can't. It's got to have zero quantum capacity. And uh, good. We've got only five minutes. Um, let's see. So for example, that means a 50% attenuation channel. Um, while there's strong correlation between input and output, it has lots of classical capacity. Um, it can't be used to transmit any quantum information from one party to another, because it would lead to a violation of, uh, of the no cloning theorem. Yeah, well, if it's less, than, like, <coughs> right. So if it's, if it's, uh, if it attenuates less than that, then it's OK. Well, if it attenuates more, then it gives even more information to the environment than, than to the output, right? So any decoder you could do here, the environment could attenuate further to mimic your channel and then also get the state out. So actually, this is a pretty cool channel because if it, has, uh, if, it has, uh, if it attenuates at rate lambda, the capacity, the quantum capacity, is actually just equal to 1 minus lambda. It depends, again, on the input power. 1 minus lambda n minus g, sorry, g of 1 minus lambda n minus g of lambda n. It's actually achieved when you do this optimization over mixed input states. It's actually achieved on a thermal state. And it turns out that you can uh, compute this capacity exactly. This is the, the quantum capacity of the attenuation channel with attenuation or with transmissivity in this beam splitter of lambda and, and uh, power allowed average photon number n. It's just given by this. And as you take n to infinity, actually, so if you allow more and more power, um, this just ends up being log of 1 minus lambda minus log of lambda. And actually, you can see this goes to 0 at lambda equals to a half. And if lambda gets bigger than a half, this goes negative, which means the capacity is actually just 0. And I think I will stop there. And tomorrow we can talk about how you get this formula. And uh, I really want to emphasize it's kind of a miracle that you can get such a formula. Because you remember all day yesterday, we talked about trying to get a, um, a formula for the classical capacity of this channel, because it's quite difficult to get um, formulas for classical capacities. Similarly, it's hard to get formulas for quantum capacities. This non-additivity of this Q1 here is actually much worse in the quantum case than in the classical case. In general, it just tends, well, many things seem to be non-additive. They're not that hard to find. Um, but this particular channel, this uh, attenuation channel, is uh, of a special form that uh, actually allows us to figure out what this quantum capacity is. So I'll stop there. Yes. What's the connection? Um, let's say you have a quantum channel, and it's related not to the distillable entanglement, but to something called the one-way distillable entanglement, when the sender is allowed to do measurements and then report answers to the receiver, but there's no, there's no uh, communication backwards. And in that case, if I make a... Uh, um, if I make a, 
um, how do I put it? The distillable entanglement of a state that I can make with the channel is also equal to, and it is also an achievable rate for communication over the channel. Yeah, so the capacity of the channel is a lower bound for the uh, distillable entanglement of any state you can make with the channel. And they're distillable, like the channel has zero quantum capacity exactly when the, uh, any state you can make with it has zero one-way distillable entanglement. So they're not identical, they're just closely related. It's a property of a state. Yeah. But, oh, you can always make a channel, a state out of a channel by preparing a, a, an entangled state, maybe a maximally entangled state, and applying the channel to half of the maximally entangled state. And now you have some state associated with the channel. And there's a connection between the one-way distillable entanglement of that state and the quantum capacity of the channel. The one, one way, that means you just do measurements. Remember we talked about LOCC where you measure and communicate that way and then you measure and communicate back to me, etc. One way distillable entanglement means one side measures and reports something to the other side and that's the end of it. 